In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Well, I feel a lot better today, so I shouldn't stumble so much. If I do, it's uh, because I'm not a good public speaker. Ha! So, uh, now I got an article from uh, Fox News, and this article really shows uh, the state of our country because something this crazy coming down from a federal judge it would have never happened not even 10 years ago I mean the people would have never even thought of this but this is what's happened a federal judge rules reciting pledge in schools unconstitutional this is in San Francisco and uh, that's understandable knowing what type of people live out there for the most part a federal judge ruled Wednesday that reciting the Pledge of Allegiance in public schools was unconstitutional. U.S. District Judge Lawrence Carlton, he's a, a black, but no, he's just a white man with a tan, ruled that the pledge's reference, uh, ruled that the pledge's reference to one nation under God violates school children's right to be free from a coercive requirement to affirm God. The judge has granted legal standing to two families represented by an atheist who lost his previous battle before the Supreme Court. Well, if you lost your battle before the Supreme Court, how can a lower court overrule that? Well, there's some technical things involved, but uh, this won't go anywhere, so I don't, I don't think we have anything to be concerned about. Uh, Read the judge's opinion by clicking here. That's part of the Internet. Carlton said he was bound by precedent of the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. What about the precedent of the Supreme Court? Which in 2002 ruled in favor of Sacramento atheist Michael Newdow that the pledge is unconstitutional when recited in public schools. Imagine every morning if the teachers had the children stand up, place their hands over their heart, and say... We are one nation that denies God exists, Newdow said in an interview with AP Radio after the ruling. I think everybody would not be sitting here saying, Oh, what harm is that? They'd be furious. And that's exactly what goes on against atheists. And it shouldn't. Well, the fact is, our country was founded on Judeo-Christian values. And if you go to Washington, D.C., the mention of God is everywhere. In fact, in the, uh, if you go to the Supreme Court and you look on their wall, they're right there, blaring, so everyone can see it, is the Ten Commandments in the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Our laws were founded on these biblical principles, and this is the insanity that's starting to uh, wreak havoc on our nation. The Supreme Court dismissed the case last year, saying Newdow lacked standing because he did not have custody of his elementary school daughter, who he sued on her behalf, or he sued the government on her behalf. Newdow, an, an attorney and a medical doctor, filed an identical case on behalf of three unnamed parents and their children. Carlton said those families have the right to sue. Carlton said he would sign a restraining order preventing the recitation of the pledge at the Elk Grove Unified, Rio Linda, and Alberta Joint Elementary School Districts. A restraining order. And that's usually issued for people who beat each other up and then they can't be near each other. But now there's a restraining order because uh, the school wants to recite the pledge and then the judge says, no, we have a restraining order against you. You cannot recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And why? Because it says under God. And under God is offensive to a lot of people, I guess. And this is our culture, which has become very arrogant and offended by everything. If you don't believe in God, so what? I mean, you must uh, apply the standards of society, the standards of uh, local uh, government and everything else. And this is just uh, somebody just trying to make a big splash and get some recognition. 
and then they'll go to hell as an atheist. Stephen Ladd, superintendent of the Elk Grove Unified School District, said the district school board has long supported allowing students to recite the pledge. And the fallacy with this is as if the school makes them stand up. And I've been in school before, and there were some jerks who decided to sit down during the Pledge of Allegiance, not stand up, not place their hand over their heart, and not uh, do it. And the teachers never once said, you must stand. Now, they probably should have, but they never did. And this is just, uh, it's ridiculous. It shows the trend that is occurring in our country, uh, the fact that many people are trying to stamp out God, well, first of all, they've been trying to stamp out doctrine for a long time. Now it's just, let's stamp out God and everything else. So the order would not extend beyond those districts unless it is affirmed by the Ninth, Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, and it could be that's a very liberal circuit court, in which case it could apply to nine western states. The decision sets up another showdown over the pledge in schools. Andrew Napolitano, a senior judicial analyst for Fox News, said the ruling will not directly affect the rest of the nation, only Sacramento. So that's a relief. There are federal judges who have ruled elsewhere in the U.S. the exact opposite of the way this federal judge has, Napolitano said. But this case only affects the area of California in which this judge sits. He added that what he expects uh, from the appeals and the school di districts, uh, which w then would be, make their way to the Supreme Court. And, of course, we're having some changes now on the Supreme Court with some new people going in there, hopefully better people, but uh, that's yet to be seen yet. And it goes on to talk about uh, how this has rippled and how many people have uh, uh, joined against it. And then it goes on to say, Carlton appointed to the Sacramento Sacramento bench in 1979 by uh, President Carter wrote that the case concerned President Carter, Democrat, Georgia, wrote that the case concerned the ongoing struggle as to the role of religion in the civil life of this nation and added that his opinion will satisfy no one involved in that debate. So this is just a sign of the times. Uh, at one time, uh, I forget the guy's name, but he made a wonderful poem, and he said, wouldn't it be awful if one day they tried to remove the Pledge of Allegiance from schools because it mentions God? And, and that was some 20 years ago when he made this uh, assertion, and now it's coming to pass. The reason why is because too few people take interest in the Word of God. These things would have never happened 20, 30 years ago. They would have never happened 10 years ago even. I never even heard of craziness like this. It shows our country is in desperate trouble. And with each successive terrible, tragic event that happens in this country, no one seems to wake up. It just keeps on going in the same direction. Now, this is just a sign of the times, and it's not the direct reason why the country will go under. The direct reason will be the fact that believers haven't taken enough interest in the Word. So turn in your Bibles now to Matthew 18:5, so that we won't 18:15 that is, so that we won't end up like those who don't care for the word. Matthew 18:15. The only way we're going to restore the country is to get serious about uh, Scripture. Matthew 18:15, and this is the corrected translation, and we have to handle these verses very, very carefully, because. Uh, there is a dispensational problem here, but really this is just common sense. What we have here in 18, 15, 16, and 17, it's really common sense. And remember the audience. The audience here is still the disciples. And this is what it says. If your fellow believer sins against you, notice, if your fellow believer sins against you, that means they've offended you in some way. You've been in church, for example. This is just a common sense type passage. And while they didn't have churches back then, I'll bring it up to date. You're in a church, and someone wrongs you in some way. Maybe they gossiped about you. Maybe they maligned you in some way and said something about you that was totally unrelated to fact and truth. And that would be someone sinning against you. It doesn't deal with sins in general. 
It doesn't deal with uh, the fact that Susie Q went out and committed adultery. Therefore, you must go up to Susie Q and say, you have committed adultery. Susie Q knows that, and it's none of your business. This deals with people who have sinned against you. This deals with a personal relationship problem. And our Lord brings this up because it's very important to the disciples. Because remember, before this, the disciples were arguing amongst themselves, Who is the greatest? Lord, am I the greatest? Is he the greatest? And of course, Peter wasn't there. He was out fishing for gold. And uh, so this debate went on. And they... And because of it, a lot of them got in competition with each other. And as a result of this competition, there were a lot of antagonistic feelings. Uh, one person would insult another and say, No, I'm the greatest because you did so and so. And then the other person would say, No, I'm the greatest because uh, you are a SOB, etc. And so there was a lot of hostility there. And this, so our Lord brings this up in terms of Christian relationships. How should you resolve a problem in a relationship? And this is, really, it's just common sense. If your fellow believer sins against you, go and show him his fault when the two of you are alone. Go and show him his fault when the two of you are alone. Go and show him his fault. Uh, we must take this with great care because go and show him his fault it's not a license for you to run around and stick your nose into other people's business. This is a personal matter. A personal matter between two people. And while the main focus here is for the disciples and the age in which they live, and the main focus also follows into the millennium, there's application to be had today. Most definitely because it's common sense. So if a fellow believer sins against you, does something unkind or something, or you have perceived some unkindness from them, go and show him his fault. It's not a license to stick your nose into their business. This must be handled with great care, for this is a case in which you have been wronged. You're the one wronged. So you go to them with this matter. You go straight to the person and talk to them about it. You expose to them what you think is the problem. Oftentimes you'll find out when you do this you see, what has this person not done? This person has not said, I was offended, I will tell the whole world how this person offended me, and then I will rectify the situation. No. You go to the person who you think has wronged you, and you go up and say, you know what, I was offended by what you said, or by what you did to me. And then you might learn that uh, they never meant any harm by it whatsoever you might learn that their intentions were completely righteous. And you might learn that uh, this offense is nothing to be upset about. Therefore, the situation is settled and you can both remain in fellowship. So what it's saying is, go and show him his fault. You go straight to the person and talk to them about it. You don't go straight to your best friend and talk to them about it and you don't try to stir up uh, antagonism against that person. You go straight to the person. This is something that is uh, somewhat, especially in the past, used in northern culture. In the southern culture, well, in northern culture, they're very frank with each other. If you've ever had experience with Yankees, you know that uh, if they think you've done them wrong, they'll uh, make it known very, very clearly with great sarcasm. And a lot of times, that's the best way to deal with it. Just go straight to the person. But in the South, we have a type of system where we'll smile on the outside, and then when we get alone with the others, we will rip them apart. That's not, that's not scriptural. And this is how our Lord tells you to deal with the, th the fact that you've been wronged, or you think you've been wronged. And this word in the Greek is a, 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 simply means you must be objective. And it means that you must relax. Maybe you don't know everything that's involved. So you go to the person and say, yeah, you know, I was offended by what you did to me yesterday. And then the person may say, well, I apologize. I didn't mean for you to be offended. And then it's settled. No gossip on the side, no maligning, no judging. 
And since the disciples had been gossiping about each other and ripping each other apart, our Lord finds it necessary at this point to tell them how to deal with the problem. And it's pretty much common sense. Just go to them and say, hey, you're not right on this and I think you've been wrong. And then it's all explained. And then we notice this. When the two of you are alone, it's a private matter. It's not for others to know about. Not at this stage of the game. It's a private matter. You're not gossiping because you're going straight to the person. You're not telling your friends about the other person. You simply go straight to the person and say, I was offended. Now, you'll never be relaxed if you tell everyone how to live. And you could definitely make the wrong application of 1815 and say, you know what? The Bible says that if a believer sins, and they completely leave out against you, but they say if a believer sins, then I must go to them and tell them where they've been wrong. And this has developed in a lot of churches. And uh, sometimes they've actually developed societies in which uh, each one figures out the weakness of the other. And if that one sins, they the pastor actually encourages them to go to the other person and say, you failed in this area. You are a whore, etc., in which everybody will talk about it. And that is your area of weakness, so we must keep tabs on it so we can tell you about it so you'll change. Well, your personal sins against God are no one's business. But when you've been wronged personally, uh, the reason why you can go straight to the person is because if you sit around and perseverate on it and think about it, you're going to be out of fellowship for a long time. But if you go straight to the person and settle the problem immediately, uh, you can both get back in fellowship and go on your way and have a good friendship. And it talks about how the a friendship would be restored. So it must be alone, meaning a private matter. You're not gossiping. You're not trying to tell someone how to live their life. Now, because if you do, you'll never live a relaxed life. And the only reason why some people like to live other people's lives is because they haven't learned how to live their own So we're not talking definitely. In this case, uh, you do have the right to tell your children how to live and how to act and what to do and where to go and who not to go with and who to go with and what church to go to. That is the parent's right to tell the child so long as they're under the roof. Uh, Of course, probably 18 would be a good breaking point to say you're on your own, but uh, if they're still under your roof, I guess you still have authority over them. So we are not talking about the parent-child relationship. Parents always have the responsibility to tell their children how they think the children should live, right or wrong. But this, on the other hand, is not a right to condemn others. It's not a right to look down your nose at others. It's not a right to go up to someone and say, you sinner. Well, who isn't? This is dealing with a personal situation. That's why it says uh, you must go to each other alone. The purpose for this is to talk about it between each other, to hash it out. And after the discussion, you may find out that uh, what you heard about the person was simply gossip. You might find out that uh, someone told you that so-and-so said such-and-such about you, and you might go to them and find out that so-and-so is the real turd and your friend was all right to begin with, and so the situation is resolved. You might find out it was simply the result of gossip and there was no truth in it at all. The emphasis here is when someone has wronged you, you should not simply... Uh, just take the gossip of it and say, yep, they did, or uh, they must have done that, and therefore uh, gossip breeds gossip, maligning breeds gossip, but instead of doing that, just go straight to the person and say, what's up? And then point five, we get to the last part of the verse in 1815. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. In other words, if he listens to you, You've regained your friendship. That is, if they've been wrong. And you might say, what do you mean doing this? And they might say, oh, i got a sin nature, I screwed up, uh, I'll try not to do it again. A personal thing between friends. And so you've regained your friendship, which is a wonderful thing. And you didn't regain your friendship by gossiping all the time. 
or maligning that friend or former friend all the time or judging them. You regained it through common sense and going straight to the person. These are common sense verses. If you take them out of context, they'll result in a lot of backbiting, things that the Bible definitely does not approve of. Now in 1816, we get to something else. Let's say he's wronged you and you went straight to him and his, uh, and the fact is he has wronged you and he's going to continue to wrong you. This is what it says. But if he does not listen, take one or two others with you that at the testimony of two or three witnesses every matter may be established. Here's where we, we must get some dispensational recognition. Because if you go to two or one or two others right now today, if you have a problem with somebody and it's not resolved when you face them immediately, and then you go to one or two others just to gossip about it, that's not what's being said here. This is actually a grassroots courtroom. It's a courtroom case. And you are not going to one or two others who are your friends. You're not going to another friend and saying, hey, this dude did me wrong. Let's go trash him. And then they come and they're all against the one guy. This two or three deals with people who are objective. One person that might be part of the courtroom case might be one who, is, who doesn't like you too much either. And the other person might be neutral. And that is so there can be objectivity in this grassroots courtroom. This is what's going to occur a lot in the millennium. They're going to have grassroots courtrooms in which uh, the reason why, and this comes out of 1 Corinthians, the reason why is uh, we are commanded not to sue in certain cases. And what happens when a believer has a problem with another believer, maybe concerning property or concerning something else, if they go before an unbelieving judge and hash out their differences before the unbelieving judge, the unbeliever is looking at two believers who are acting like babies. And the judge has more sense than they do concerning the matter. The matter. Therefore, they are a blot to Christianity. They're not living their spiritual life, and all they're doing is acting like a Jerry Springer case. And so the judge looks at Christians just as if they were unbelievers. And a lot of times they act just like unbelievers. That's why the Apostle Paul said, uh, don't sue your brother, that is your fellow Christian. Don't do it. And uh, there are some cases, in criminal cases, where it's absolutely necessary if they've stolen from you, if they've uh, battered you in some way, of course that's necessary. There are, are exceptions. But in terms of just some little financial thing, in terms of something like that, we're, we're, not, we're commanded not to sue. And another reason why our country is showing great degeneracy is people sue everybody, believer or unbeliever. They just, they're sue crazy. So this is actually a grassroots type courtroom. And we know this because it says that at the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. Testimony means that this is a form of a courtroom, albeit it's a, a type of a grassroots courtroom. It's not really official. And oftentimes problems arise in churches. That's why we have deacons in churches. And that's why problems go to the deacon. And then if the deacon can't figure it out, they go straight to the pastor. And then they sit down and they all hash it out. And they figure out, uh, they figure out the facts objectively. And they come to a conclusion. This could occur most definitely in gossip cases or maligning cases in church where one person might be a total disruptor of a church because all they do is gossip, malign, and judge. And because they gossip, malign, and judge, it causes great problems in the church. And so the matter is brought to a deacon. Two or three, of course, in the case of a large church. And so they go to the deacon and say, this person wronged me, this person has been gossiping about me in church and maligning me, and I don't even feel comfortable coming to church anymore because this person always talks about me and looks down on me. And so the deacon takes it up and calls a meeting in which uh, uh, the perpetrator and the innocent victim come together and then they hash it out. And then, uh, of course, the pastor is let in on it, and so the final decision can be made. Should the gossip be kicked out, or should, uh, or should there be some type of resolution? 
And this happens in churches, which is explained in uh, first, the Apostle Paul explains in many areas, in Romans and Corinthians, how to deal in the church with certain instances such as this. Remember, the church isn't formed yet, but this is just a common sense between the disciples and also how it's going to be handled in the millennium. First of all, they're not going to go straight to the administration. They're not going to go straight to the government. First of all, they're going to meet with each other. If it's not resolved, then they're going to meet with uh, two or three objective people. And then if it's not resolved, then they must take it to the higher court, to the administration. But if he does not listen, take one or two others with you that at the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. It's a courtroom type case. 1817. If he refuses to listen to them... In other words, the person who has been thought to be wrong actually ends up being wrong. And that person says, I'm not wrong. I'm going to continue gossiping about this creep. I'm going to continue to malign this creep. They do not belong in this church. I hope they do feel uncomfortable when they walk in the church. And if this creep acts like that and refuses to listen to them, then they must take it to the administration. Tell it to the administration. Your Bibles might say, tell it to the deacon." Or it might say, what does yours say, Dallas? Church. Well, that's the King James Version. Uh, the church ain't there yet. It's starting to form, but it's, it doesn't... Uh, the church and even Christians don't even uh, come out until Acts. But it is a, a foundation for how the church should function. It does apply in some ways to the church age. And we get this from the Apostle Paul. However... Uh, he's still teaching to the disciples and in the millennium we know for sure this is the way uh, things are going to be handled. So if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the administration. In the case of a church, the administration would be the deacons. Tell it to the deacons. Now this does not mean that you stand up in front of a church and air out your sins. It doesn't mean that you get up and say, yes, I've wronged so-and-so. I, uh, I slept with her husband. And then in that case, uh, the only thing you've done is given the gossip mongers in the church a time to uh, celebrate a sin for about two months. And they celebrate the fact and laugh about it and gossip about it. And they're happy because finally they have something to talk about because otherwise they don't think. And since they don't think, they're bored out of their minds. And if you're bored, you gossip. So they, it's not a, a, a situation in which people are allowed to get up in front of the church and say, I wronged you, and then cry about it, and then everyone has a field day with it. So if he refuses to listen to them, treat him like a Gentile or tax collector. This is funny because Matthew is a tax collector. So again, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the administration. You can say church, but it's not... Uh, it's not the whole church. You don't go around telling the whole church. It deals with the administration. And if it involves the church, it deals with the deacons. No one else. And if he refuses to listen to them, treat him like a Gentile or tax collector. In other words, just stay away from him. Oftentimes, the decision is made in the uh, church situation where a person has been a gossip, a maligner, and a judger and where the person has disrupted the church to where the person is kicked out. And the, in that way, people can come to church without feeling uncomfortable about being talked about by the others. Of course, the Word of God is going to talk about you. It always does and step on your toes. And I don't talk about you personally. It's just the fact that every part of the Word of God steps on everyone's toes at some point, including my own. So we have... Here, there's Romans 16, 17 through 18, and you should probably turn there so that we can get uh, uh, some type of church age reference to this and so that we can know what it means when it says to treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. Uh, you know, certain things arise in larger churches where people have been gossiping in the church. Therefore, the leader of the pack who has been showing hostility toward others through gossip, maligning, and judging, must come before the deacons. 
And then it has to be figured out exactly what was go- what is going on and it has to be figured out objectively. So if this if it is established by the if it is established in the church by the deacons that someone and the pastor of course that someone has been gossiping in the church to the point that it makes others uncomfortable to attend church then such a person must be thrown out. Now in in some cases this will never happen. And what should you do if this never happens in your case? Romans 16:17. Now I told you on Tuesday that uh, you should be careful with whom you hang out with. And I wasn't telling you that to tell you how to live your life. I was telling you that because Romans 16:17 through 16:19 makes it very clear that you should be very keen as to whom you hang around with. Not me making it up. I wouldn't dare make it up. It's all part of Scripture. Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, royal family, that's everyone who's believed in Christ, now I urge you to keep your eyes on those who create dissension and occasions for stumbling contrary to the doctrine that you learned. In fact, avoid them. Now I urge you, royal family, to keep your eyes on those who create dissension. Keep your eyes on those people who gossip all the time, malign all the time, judge all the time. They create dissension. They create strife. They would love nothing else to destroy other people's lives. They would love nothing else to destroy churches. And they do, oftentimes. But that's why believers must keep believers in fellowship, must keep their eyes on them, uh, be, and uh, keep your eyes on those who create dissension and occasions for stumbling contrary to the doctrine that you learned. In other words, the only way you're going to keep your eyes on people like this is to have enough doctrine to recognize it. If you don't have enough doctrine to recognize it, well, then you won't recognize it and you won't avoid them. But once you know the doctrine, you are commanded, avoid them. 16.18 For such are slaves, not to our Lord Jesus Christ, but to their own emotions. I don't know what the King James says. Are you reading King James, Dallas? What does it say? Where it uh, should say in 16.18, but their own emotions. Appetite. Well, they got that from stomach. And stomach and belly. That's what King James would say, belly. And the fact is, in the in the olden times, when they were in the Greek language, they didn't have a lot of the emotional terms that we've developed today. And so they would simply use a body part for an emotion. Stomach. And what you would think from the English is they've made their... Uh, they're not slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the slaves of their belly. So you could come up with all sorts of things. You could say, well, they're fat and love to eat all the time, and their, their God is their belly, which means they love food. And that would be a ridiculous uh, type of interpretation. Now, it would be an interpretation anyone would make, not knowing the original languages, and not knowing that stomach in the Greek always meant emotion. And they have many delineations concerning emotions. So, it's, for such are slaves, not to our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own emotions. By their smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the stupid. And it doesn't mean they're stupid because they were born that way. It means they're stupid from lack of learning the Word of God. They are stupid concerning Bible doctrine. And usually they want to be. They want to be ignorant. But those people who are stupid from lack of Bible doctrine, those people who are slaves to their emotions, Those people who have the me syndrome, me, 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 let's talk about me and all the problems I have. Well, these are people who will run down others and create dissension. And the Bible is very clear. Avoid them. If you don't, you'll become like them. Then in 16.19, Your obedience is known to all of us. And thus I rejoice over you. Your, your, your obedience is known to all, and thus I rejoice over you. 
This obedience is related to humility. You have done what the Apostle Paul has said. You've avoided the people who always create strife, dissension, and occasions for stumbling. Therefore, you are obedient. You have enough humility to understand that the Word of God has greater power in your life than a friendship. And if the Word of God does not have greater power in your life than a friendship, that means your love for people exceeds your love for God and you are a loser. And you will be punished just like the person with whom you hang around because you like them in some perverse way. Then in 1619, your obedience is known to all of us Thus I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and in what is evil. When you're wise to what is evil, gossip, maligning, judging, vilification, revenge motivation, revenge modus operandi is one of the worst evil systems a believer can live under. We're also commanded to uh, avoid those who are fornicators and brag about it just like the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 who had sex with his mother in incest. The the Apostle Paul uh, commanded everyone to avoid him. And that was because when he bragged about it to everyone, that became a point of great gossip and maligning in the church. And it was splitting up the church. And the Apostle Paul said, why didn't you get rid of this man? Instead of bragging and instead of boasting and instead of saying, I would never do anything like that, why didn't you just uh, kick him out for bragging about something so sick and forget about it? That's why this occurred. Stuff like this does arise in churches. Uh, Rarely, I doubt, anything like that would happen, but I bet it has, even contemporarily in the United States. So you must be careful with whom you hang around with And you must understand that uh, if you hang around with evil, you're not going to change evil, but evil can certainly change you. And if you hang around with evil, and evil includes those people who are obviously and always looking to cause strife and always offended by somebody and always ready to cause some type of trouble or occasions to cause stumbling for others, then it's time for you to recognize you need to be interested in what is good and innocent. And what is that? The Word of God. And you must avoid what is evil. If you try to change the evil, you'll just simply become evil yourself. You can't change evil, but evil can change you. And if you hang around people who are psychotic, it's been known that the person who has tried to change their psychotic ways has often become psychotic themselves very easily that this occurs. It's been depicted in movies. Uh, Sometimes these movies were meant to be hilarious, and and in some cases, uh, something about Bob or or something like that. What is it? What about Bob? Bob? That's a movie about a psychiatrist who is driven crazy by a man who's crazy. And if you, you'll go crazy hanging around crazy people. It's just inevitable. You can't change them, but they can certainly change you. So eight, that's because of the great pull of evil and apostasy. It has a tremendous amount of pull. And the reason why our country is in such trouble is because apostasy has a tremendous amount of pull. And we are so apostate, it is becoming more and more difficult for people to get on the Word of God because all they hear their whole life is religion, gossip, maligning, judging. All they do is uh, go through life thinking they're great when they're covered in dung. This is apostasy. And at some point, God has to look down and say, well, these people are not going to get with doctrine. It's locked in because the apostasy is so great, I must wipe out this apostate generation. Therefore, the discipline begins. And that's what's happening to our country, just as I told you in the beginning of the message with that article. That's a sure sign, an overt sign, that something's wrong. Somebody is upset and actually gets a federal judge to stop the Pledge of Allegiance and signs an order against a school not to recite the Pledge of Allegiance? Do you know that when you turn 18 years old, 18 years old men, you have to sign a paper? And that paper ensures you that if a draft is needed, you will be called into military service. If you don't sign that paper, you will uh, not get federal jobs, federal aid, you won't get Social Security, and uh, you may even be jailed. And you must sign that paper saying you will serve your country. 
Now, are they going to make that unconstitutional? They'll probably try. And as soon as they do that, uh, we get attacked and there's no way we can defend ourselves. They'll say it's unconstitutional. You're making somebody serve this country outside of their will? Of course. You're part of the country. You, that's how you've received freedom. And my dad served after being drafted. And my grandfather, I don't remember if he was drafted or not. He may have just joined to get away from the draft. I think he was drafted, though, because he was going to go to Hollywood, and uh, he actually had it lined up to be in a Western. And then he was called to go to war. Now today, if uh, some young man was going to go sign up for Hollywood, and their mothers are all elated, my son's going to be rich and famous and everybody's going to know his name and I'll be on TV too and he's been drafted? Oh, hell no. That's what they'll say. And that's because our culture has become degenerate. And that's because we are falling apart as a nation and uh, he had enough integrity to say, all right, I'll go serve my country. So then he spent time shooting at airplanes from a ship and he would see him crash and come pretty close to him, all of which would be a lot more exciting than playing like John Wayne. So he, he probably enjoyed the fact of the choice that he made. And my father would have never traded in uh, going to Canada for going to Vietnam for nothing. He's seen more in a lifetime than most of us will ever see because of that experience. And it's a wonderful thing to serve your country, but the way our country is going is, uh, well, we're degenerate. And if you don't have a military, and if you don't have a young generation willing to fight for freedom, that freedom will be destroyed. Just as it says in Washington, D.C., I know you went there. I don't know if you saw the plaque. It said, freedom is not free. A big plaque. I forget where it is. Somewhere in Washington, D.C. And it's not free. You've got to fight for freedom. Every generation in this country has, including this one, including your own, for those of you who are younger. And they're fighting for it. And then uh, people uh, go against it, which is a point of degeneracy for our country. Then in 1818, a point of truth. What did I miss? Uh, let, oh, yeah, we're going back to Matthew now. We just finished 1619 and Romans 1617. Now we're back to Matthew 1818. A point of truth. Whatever you bind... Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you release on earth, or loosed as the King James says, and whatever you release on earth will have been released from the source of heaven. This is an agency type of uh, thing in the Greek language. And the agent is the source of heaven. So a point of truth, whatever you bind, this binding has to do with witnessing for Christ. You witness for Christ. He's talking to the disciples. He says, disciples, you witness for Christ. Whatever you bind, that is, these people whom they've witnessed to have decided to believe in Christ. Whatever you bind on earth, you've witnessed, they've believed. So they're bound. We'll have been bound in heaven. This is, of course, based on who and what God is. It's not based on who and what the evangelist is or who and what the disciples are or if they're even a good uh, type of witness person. But it means if they witness and the person believes in Christ, that person is bound. They are bound on earth and will have been bound in heaven. This is another verse dealing with eternal security. It's been bound. They believed they're, they're bound on earth and in heaven. And because they believed in Christ, as a result of the disciples witnessing for Christ, they will be bound in heaven. This is based on who and what God is, though, and you should never uh, get a fat head just because you've witnessed and people have believed. It's our duty to witness. And, of course, God provides everything else. And uh, they are bound in, on earth and in heaven, meaning they can't lose their salvation. And whatever you release on earth will have been released from the source of heaven. And he says this as a way to keep the disciples from becoming arrogant. You've given the gospel, disciples, but the gospel is from the source of heaven. That's the power in witnessing. Personality is not the power in witnessing. You can have the dullest personality on the face of the earth, and if you simply give someone the gospel and they desire it, 
you simply give them Acts 16.31a, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if they're positive, they'll believe. It doesn't depend on personality. These things deal with the power of God. And that's why it says, and whatever you release on earth, the gospel, will have been released from the source of heaven. You're releasing it, but what you're releasing is from the source of heaven. You're releasing the gospel. You've, you've been given the gospel, and you have been giving the gospel, but the gospel is from the source of heaven. That's the power in witnessing. No amount of begging someone to believe ever works. No amount of hand-wringing. No amount of weeping tears. While a lot of young ladies have had uh, fathers who've never believed in Christ, and so they weep and say, Daddy, believe. Daddy, please believe. If you don't, you'll go to hell. And all that's true. But all that personality and all that weeping and wailing and all that begging has no power. The power is in the message to believe in Christ. And then somewhere down the line, maybe they're on their deathbed and some pastor comes in and says, believe in Christ or you're going to hell. And there's no weeping and there's no type of pleasant personality. And he says, okay, I believe. And so they wept and all that, thinking that would help, and it never does. The only thing that is going to uh, allow them to believe is their own volition, and you only do it, and the personality is never the issue. Now, our Lord is making this, um, uh, this, he's giving this doctrine to the disciples for uh, three reasons. Now, in verse 18, 18, it's dealing with witnessing. Now before, remember, what was he telling the disciples? He's saying, look, you need to know how to get along. You're not in competition in the spiritual life. And if you do feel wronged, you need to go straight to the person in privacy. And you don't need to be running around gossiping and maligning against this person. You need to take it up with them. And then if it doesn't work out, take it up with a grassroots court. And this is for the millennium and, of course, for them in that age. And then if it doesn't work out, go to the administration or the real court in the case of a church go to the deacons they're the administration and then the deacon comes to the pastor for the final approval of the decision or disapproval whichever occurs and so he has been telling them you must solve your relationship problems and now he's given three reasons why actually the reason why you must solve your relationship problem is number one witnessing this is found in 1818 and he's telling them, as he's told them before, look, you're going to have to go out and witness. And while they don't have the filling of God the Holy Spirit yet, they will receive the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they must stay in fellowship in order for them to have the most effective power in witnessing. So in 1818, he's saying, look, you need to get along. You need to stop competing with each other in order that you can have an effective witnessing life. That's number one. In 1819, we have something else. And 1819 is not dealing with witnessing anymore. 1819 is dealing with worship. So in 1819, another point of doctrine, that if two people on earth... Well, this actually deals with prayer. I got ahead of myself. 1819, another point of doctrine, that if two people on earth agree together about whatever thing they ask, my Father in heaven will do it for them. 1819, another point of doctrine, that if two people on earth agree together about whatever thing they ask, my Father in heaven will do it for them. Now, the Greek word here is symphony. I don't know how many of you will ever join a symphony when you get to high school or if you've joined one now or even a band or something else. But the Greek word is symphony. And what this is saying is, what's in a symphony? Well, you've got violins, you've got cellos, you've got basses, you've got flutes, you've got clarinets, you've got trumpets, you've got drums even, percussion. You've got all sorts. You've even got that little thing they ting on, ting. And all of these things represent different personalities. And you can think of a trumpet as having a complete different personality than the violin. The violin is sweet and soothing. The trumpet is brass and brazen. And the cello is a nice, sweet instrument to listen to, while the percussion will make you go deaf, especially if you listen to it the way they do today on the radio. Boom, boom, boom. It's a part of a, per per a percussion-type line that is done with electronics, of course, and they make the decibel very low, the bass line. Everybody likes bass. 
So, it's a different personality, though. One's a booming personality, another is sweet and kind, another has a different type of timber. And so, what our Lord is saying by using this Greek word symphony, actually Aramaic, but translated into the Greek, another point of doctrine, that if two people on earth agree together, and just two people have completely different personalities, and so you could come together in prayer, me and you, whoever, or you and the person sitting next to you, and that becomes a symphony because you both have different personalities, but that's not the issue. What matters is that whatever you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for them. Now remember the stipulation. He's already told them, look, you need to get straightened out with your brother or your fellow believer. You need to get straightened out with your sister, your fellow believer. And the reason why, this is point two, effective prayer. If your relationships in life are filled with strife, your prayer is not going to be effective. And if two believers are at each other's throats, the prayer is not effective. And what you need to do is work as a team no matter what the personality. That's the point. You're praying with a trumpet. You're the violin. The trumpet's loud. You're sweet and soft. So what? Don't get offended by the trumpet, violin. And trumpet, don't look down on the violin for being sweet and soft. Come together as a symphony. Meaning, have no discord, no strife. You're on the same team. And if you pray together, my Father in heaven will do it for them. That's the power of prayer. It is also the power that comes out in prayer meetings. We've had a few. They're, they're at 545. I've missed a couple. Uh, but they're at 545 on Sunday. And uh, that's because two or more people get together and pray. It's effective. Now, of course, this has other application as well. And even though it does mean that if two people get together, agree in symphony with each other, or both in fellowship, and both pray for the same thing, it'll be done for them. It also means, it's, this is found in Luke, that uh, the, uh, the disciples at this point were offered the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And this is actually what it refers to. And they could have had it. And our Lord said, look, just two of you disciples agree on it. Get together in prayer and pray for it. We don't pray for it today. It's automatically given when we believe. But if you get to that is the filling until you sin. But if you get together and pray for it, I'll give it to you. I'll give you the filling of God the Holy Spirit, which all of you need desperately. Not one of them got together and did it. Probably to the dismay of our Lord, who had said, look, you can have these things. You can have the filling of God the Holy Spirit right now and you'll be able to go out and witness right now and you'll have the knowledge to be able to get with the Word of God right now. But they didn't do it. That's really what this is referring to, but it also applies to regular prayer among believers today. 1820. So the first point is for witnessing. You must have harmony, symphony with other believers for witnessing. If there's constant strife, you'll fail in your witnessing life. Point two, effective prayer. You must have harmony among the brethren in order to have effective prayer. All this time, you also, by the way, must have marital harmony, marital symphony for effective prayer because if both of you are mad at each other, you're out of fellowship and your prayers will not go any higher than the ceiling. And marriage is actually brought out. By the way, the marriage tape, uh, I won't be here tomorrow by way of announcement. I guess I'll have to call Darlene in case she was wanting to show up. I don't know of anyone else who needs to be called. So, uh, I won't be here tomorrow. I've got some things to do. But I do have the first marriage series. It'll be uploaded tonight. Tried to get the CD out here, but uh, time ran short on me. And uh, I'll probably bring them down anyway after church and just lay them in here in case anybody wants to come in on their free will and get it. But it'll also be on the Internet tonight. And uh, by the way, if you're failing in marriage, you're going to fail in your prayer life. But God will not hear your prayers because of all the strife in, within the, mar the confounds of marriage. Then the third thing. This is found in 1820. First reason for being within a fellowship for us is witnessing. Second reason, effective prayer. Third reason, 1820. For where two or three are assembled in my name. This is for the purpose of worship service. The subject is no longer prayer. 
So this is for worship service. This is why I care not for numbers. Because two or three, two or three, assembled together in my name in a worship service, I am there among them. What's it matter if there's a thousand or if there's two or three? That's the point our Lord is making. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one hill of beans. He's there with two or three, and he's there with a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand. doesn't matter. The issue is doctrine. This is what he's bringing out. For where two or three are assembled in my name in a worship service, I am there among them. And the reason why he brings this up because, is because if you're mad at someone within the church or even outside the church, if you're out of fellowship, you're not worshiping. Oh, you might be listening to doctrine and you might get up on Sunday morning and sing with us, but if you're mad at somebody, if you're offended at someone, you're not worshiping, you're in the sin nature. So the third reason to be uh, getting along with each other, as it were, to not have strife among believers is for effective worship. So these are the three points our Lord brings out. First of all, says, hey, you need to get along. Stop what you're doing. And then out of this comes these three instances in which he tells them the, the importance of their Christian service. First of all, witnessing. That's part of all of us, all of our Christian service. We're all commanded to witness. And if you don't know how to witness, there's a good book over here on witnessing that explains exactly how you should witness. And then number two, effective prayer. We have went over prayer, so you should know how to have effective prayer. There's a book over there on prayer as well. And then effective worship. The three reasons why believers must have enough common sense not to gossip, malign, and judge, but to be in fellowship. And if the problem irks them so bad that they're going to be out of fellowship, they need to go talk to the person and say, what's, what's going on? But usually, and the reason why he had to tell these disciples that is because they didn't have enough assets to where they just let it roll off their back. I can't, I don't think, I, I can't remember when I just confronted somebody and said, uh, well, there's been times when the problems needed to be worked out, but I can't remember where I was offended and just went up and I was offended by what you did. I would feel kind of like a baby. So what? We all get offended. But if you are, instead of being out of fellowship, it's better to resolve it, and that's common sense. And that's what our Lord is telling the disciples. They're baby believers, and they need to learn how to resolve this, or they'll never grow up spiritually. 18.21 Then Peter came to him and said, Then Peter came to him. Peter had been out fishing. Now he, he pops up in the conversation. And it's always Peter saying something. He just got the end of what our Lord was saying because he walked in and he saw our Lord standing there with probably his child. And so he's listened for the past uh, probably ten minutes or so. And so Peter comes up with a question. He's always the one with the question. Nothing wrong with that. Our Lord's glad to answer it. At least he's showing interest. The other ones are probably sitting there going, Duh! But uh, Peter comes in and says, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? As many as seven times? And actually what comes out here is Peter thought very highly of himself that he came up with the number of seven. And I can tell you this because Peter knew parts of the Mosaic Law and he knew that in the Mosaic Law, as per the law as it was set, forgiveness was three times. In the Mosaic Law, it was three times. Forgive your brother three times. But that dealt with law, of course. And they did have the roy the, a type of... They weren't royal family, but they did have a type of royal law to uh, treat your neighbor as you would like to be treated yourself. But under the law of the land, three times was how many times the Mosaic Law said. So Peter comes up and says, as many as seven times? He had probably counted about seven times that he had forgiven someone who was there. Maybe Judas Iscariot or someone else. And so he thought highly of himself. I forgave them seven times. Then our Lord comes back and tells this to Peter. Jesus said to him, Not seven times, I tell you, but seventy times seven times. Now that's not literal. And you don't sit down and calculate seventy times seven and say, I must forgive him one hundred and forty, etc. times. Well, it's seventy times seven. It's way more than that. Four hundred and ninety. Told you I sucked in math. It's hard to do math when you're speaking anyway. Try it sometime. So we have 490 times. 
And But this doesn't mean literally 490 times. It means infinitely. He's just throwing out numbers. In other words, uh, forgive your fellow believer an infinite number of times. Now, I understand you could go back and say to me, what about Romans 16, 17 and 16, 18 that you told me about? What about the fact that I must avoid them? Well, there's different ways to avoid people. You can separate. You can love someone uh, who's a thousand miles away, and that's the only way you'll love them. If they were in your periphery, there would be strife. And there's a way to have impersonal love. And you're not commanded to hate anyone, and you don't avoid people because you hate them. You avoid them for your own benefit so that you're not influenced by them. You don't avoid them because you have some personality conflict. You avoid them because they might ruin your spiritual life and take away your crown. And this avoidance has to do with both mental separation and in some cases physical separation, but it doesn't mean you hate the person. There are people in my family whom I avoid. I don't hate them. I love them very much. And I love them from a distance. Because if I were to hang around them and start going to their church, as they always want me to do, I'll end up like they are. And the funny thing is, I never tell them to come to this church, but they're always, hey, come to my church. Let's have a Holy Ghost revival, etc. Well, let's not. I'll love you from a distance. But I never say, well, you're welcome here. And I wouldn't want them here because as soon as I said something they didn't like, uh, out the door and to gossip they would go which would mean blessing for me, so they're invited if they walk in. I'm not going to kick them out, but you don't understand. <laughs> anyway, then Peter said to him, of course, uh, and the Lord said, do it an infinite number of times. And then in 1823, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. Now, before we get into this, let me just close with this forgiveness passage. The fact that we're supposed to forgive other believers an infinite number of times. That includes those believers who are obnoxious to us. So what we need to do in our brains is a, a bit of reverse psychology. How many times have you desired to be forgiven? You did something stupid, you know it, you did it from the old sin nature, and so you say, uh, I did something stupid, will you forgive me? How many? Don't answer it out loud, just think about it. How many times have you sought forgiveness? And how many of times have you expected forgiveness? Of course you expect it. And so, if you reverse it and say, well, I want forgiveness for myself, but I'm not going to give forgiveness to anyone else that shows your arrogance. You see, all of us have obnoxious traits, myself included. I might have more than others. My wife says no, but she's lying. And we all have obnoxious traits. And, and sometimes we get out of line and we uh, ask for forgiveness. And we expect it from the other person with whom we have a relationship. Now, the Lord forgives us an infinite amount of times. And we could rebound a thousand times today because we had to. And the Lord forgives us every single time. Infinite. And so since the Lord forgives us an infinite amount of time, and since Colossians says we should forgive as the Lord forgives, then we should do it an infinite amount of times with fellow believers. Now, this forgiveness doesn't have to be... Uh, you must be intimate and hug each other and you're forgiven and weep about it, although if you're married that might happen, but not with everyone that you would be a bit kooky. But you might just uh, forgive them in your mental attitude and be separate from them and say, whatever, they gossip about me, whatever, I forgive them, I don't care. It means blessing for me anyway is what you should think. But that doesn't mean try to stir up gossip for the means of blessing. Some people have done that and they're idiots. But every time that uh, your trait is obnoxious and every time it comes out, you want forgiveness, including myself. So we're all on the same page with this point. All of us want forgiveness, and the Bible commands all of us to give forgiveness. Forgive and disregard. Disregard it and move on. And we'll see the parable of the implacable slave Sunday. And we will learn about how how our Lord gives a parable of how 
someone who was the lord of a, a lot of money forgave someone $10 million in debt. And then someone else, that same person who was forgiven $10 million, will not forgive one of the other people under them $20 of debt. This is a, an analogy to the fact that the Lord has forgiven us a lot of debt. Yet when we do not forgive other believers, we are just like the man who will not forgive $20 of debt. Therefore, we go under severe divine punishment. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May we come to understand more of grace orientation, and may we come to understand that we must forgive as Christ has forgiven. And that means we must forgive and forget the wrongdoing done to us, and that we must grow in grace and in knowledge. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.